So, so Christmas is a little bit weird if you think about it. I mean, it really is. It's, it's, a, it's a day that we decide to eat a lot of food, we buy each other presents, we decorate a tree, all because we're celebrating the birth of a Jewish kid. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, if you think about it, I don't, it, 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 some of you may here have a Jewish ancestry. I don't know. But I'm willing to guess most of us don't have a Jewish ancestry. So what are we doing? Taking a whole day, spending more money in retail than we spend any other time of the year to celebrate the birth of this Jewish kid. And it's interesting because when Paul's writing this, he's, he's writing mainly to people that aren't Jews. They're Gentiles. They're non-Jews. So they're people whose culture would not have included this idea of the stuff that we see in the Old Testament, this idea of a God who's over all, this idea of a God who's made everything, a God who speaks through prophets, so on and so forth. They, they would have been those people who that wasn't their culture, but they'd come to a faith in Jesus. And part of the thing that was going on in this culture was they were wrestling with, well, Okay, how Jewish do I need to be? If I'm a Gentile, do I have to become a Jew to actually be a Christian? That's one of the things that they wrestled with. A lot of first, the first people that were Christians wrestled with this issue. And so what Paul's writing about, and don't forget, Paul himself was a Jew. What Paul's writing about here is he's writing about the fact that even though sometimes there's cultural tensions between Jews and Gentiles, that in Jesus, those tensions are satisfied. Because God has, through the Jews, always intended there be a plan to reach the Gentiles. Now this is good news for me and you. It's good news because we read there, right? Uh, uh, we read it earlier, Neil read it earlier, verse 13, about this kind of prayer wish that Paul writes for us, that the God of hope would fill us with joy and peace and hope. We just read it again. And we think about those ideas, joy, peace, hope. And these are the things that we long to experience. These are the things that we are pursuing at Christmas. We want to celebrate. We want joy. And so we, 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 we invest a lot of time and a lot of money to make the festivities joyful. But then things go wrong. There's a family fight. I don't know about you, but in my, my household growing up, it wasn't a Christian household, but in my household growing up, we used to fight all the time. In fact, I was raised by my, old, my dad and my three older brothers. No women in the house, so either Thanksgiving, American holiday, or Christmas, international holiday, or Super Bowl, another American holiday, <laughs> there would be some sort of fist fight that would happen. Too much alcohol flowing, start someone to get an argument, and there'd be a fist fight. That was our holidays. So we started off wanting joy, and we ended up in tears and sometimes bloodshed. It wasn't pretty. And we all want hope, don't we? Hope meaning an expectation of good. We want to think there's something good waiting for us in the future. And sometimes we have a hope that, oh, Christmas, this Christmas, this will be the year, right? This will be the year where we come together as families, we, we reconcile with each other, and finally we'll all be together. That's our hope. And then what happens? You tell Aunt Bessie to bring, you know, certain, uh, such such a dish, and she's like, I don't want to bring that dish, I want to bring this dish, and then there's an argument in the family, and then you don't come together. And there's your hope dashed. And you kind of settle for, okay, I'll just take some peace, you know? Some peace and quiet. Maybe I'll just have some rest at Christmas. And then you decide to shop. <laughs> and you go out into the city center, and it's absolute chaos. And you try to wrap the presents so that nobody sees what you got them, and they, you got kids like mine who want to kind of figure out who's the secret Santa and who's got what. And again, you, you think, I just want some rest, I just want some peace. And even then, it's hard to get that at Christmas. And it's funny because as we talk about these things, joy and peace and hope, they're these lovely things that are intangible, hard to hold on to. They're like concepts that we think, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if that was true? And this is often how we handle these things. This is often how we, in our cynical society, deal with these kinds of ideas. Wouldn't it be nice if that was true? And so what Paul's writing to, to these believers in Rome, these mainly Gentile believers in Rome, is wanting, he's wanting to convince them, listen, this is just not a, a nice idea. This is a reality. This is the reason Jesus came. To make these things a reality.
And so when we pick it up in verse 8, Paul writes, Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision. That phrase circumcision, is just a, it's a, a way to identify the Jews. They, they had a covenant with God, and that covenant was confirmed by the every male child born was circumcised on the eighth day. So that idea of the circumcision is just a, another way to identify the Jews. And, and so what Paul's saying is Jesus came first and foremost, listen, to serve the Jews, to serve the, the nation of Israel. That's why he came. And he did that for a very real reason, or in a very real way, we should say. He, he, he served them through his life. We see the kind of miracles that Jesus did. Jesus did the kind of miracles that a believing Jew would expect only God can do. Jesus showed that he had authority over nature. Comes the sea with a word. He has authority over demonic spirits, rebukes demons, and they have to flee. He has, he has authority over sickness. He says just a word and someone's healed. doesn't even have to be there. He has authority over death. He raises people from the dead. Things that, uh, from a Jewish perspective, only God can do. And he does, he does those miracles for that reason. He wants to show himself as not just a Messiah figure, but God the Son. He does this also, though, through his death. The Bible teaches us that in his death, he's serving us. Now, we know that Jesus came as a servant. That's, that's, you, you might not know this, but that's the reason our, our church is called Servant's Church. And the apostrophe is before the S. It's because Jesus is the servant, and this is his church, not ours. It's the Servant's Church. It's Jesus' church. He came as a servant. He showed himself as one who took the lowest position to help those he loved. Listen to this. In, in John chapter 13, we have this great picture of Jesus literally washing the disciples' feet. And he says to them, You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And so he comes as a servant, and he calls us to the example of serving one another. But it's more than that. Listen to this. This is the theme verse for our church. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, notice, and give his life a ransom for many. Do you know what a ransom is? A ransom is a payment to get somebody who's enslaved to buy them back. It's, it's this idea that you, are, you, you can't pay for your own debt, so somebody ransoms you. Jesus is saying that he came as a servant, and that service came to a, a, a peak, a crescendo, by him offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins. A ransom for our sins. Specifically for the sins of the Jewish nation. Now, he didn't just stay dead, though. We know the story. Three days later, what happens? He rises from the dead. This is why we celebrate Easter. But also, listen, Paul writes that Jesus came to serve the circumcision for this reason. Verse 8, notice, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the Father. In other words, listen, Jesus came not just as a payment for sin and an example of service, but also he came to fulfill all the promises that God made to his people Israel. And this was his priority. Jesus' priority was to, to minister to the Jews and to say, listen, all that God has already said in this Old Testament scripture, all that he said, I came to fulfill. We read this in, John, in Matthew 15, 24. Jesus answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His concentration, his priority was the house of Israel for a very specific reason. What he was wanting to do was, he was wanting to show himself in such a way that people would say, okay, this is the one that God has promised. Think of it this way. All the promises of the Old Testament, all the prophecies about who the Messiah, the, the Christ, the God's chosen king would be, all those things are kind of like a postcode. If you're trying to find a place, what do we do nowadays? We Google it. We punch in a postcode. Boop, boop, boop. And what happens? It comes up a little map and we think, okay, that's where we're supposed to go. We ask for directions. How do we get to that postcode? And it shows us directions. But without the postcode, we wouldn't know where we are going. And so what Jesus is doing in fulfilling all these prophecies and all these promises of God, is he's kind of saying, listen, I am that postcode. If you want to know how to get to God, if you want to know who God is or what God is like, if you want to know if God has actually spoken, you've got to go through me. 
He's the beginning and the end. He's the means and the destination. That's how he presents himself. And so he concentrates on ministering to the Jews because he wants us to know, okay, this is who he is. One of the things that people object about Christianity is they say, okay, I don't like that you, Christianity, especially you evangelicals, you tend to be so exclusive. How can you say that the only way to know God is through Jesus? It seems to be so exclusive. Well, well think, stay with me for a second. Think about this. If there is a God, and we definitely believe because of Jesus there is a God, does it make sense that he'd say, there's a numerous uh, a ways that you can get to me, and then we'd have to guess which ways are right and which ways are wrong? Because nobody believes that every way is right. Right? Everyone wants to throw out the Hitler, th the Hitler argument. Well, everyone's going to go to heaven, well, except for maybe Hitler. Well, who, who gets to draw the line at Hitler? Who gets to draw the line at all? Only God does. And so it makes sense if there's a good God who wants us to know Him, that He would make it as clear as possible. And that's what He does. He sends these Old Testament prophets that say things about who the Messiah is going to be, and then when Jesus comes and fulfills all those things, we can go, boom, there's the postcode. We know exactly where we're supposed to be. Jesus is the one we're supposed to follow. Let's talk about some of these things because Jesus is the confirmation, it says, Paul says here, of all that the Old Testament said. Here's what we know about the Old Testament. We know that God's chosen kings, from prophecies in the Old Testament, we know that God's chosen king, that's what the word Christ or Messiah means, that he would, number one, he would bring a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 says that. That when the Messiah comes, he's going to bring a new covenant. A covenant is a contract made in love. That's what God has done with His people. He makes a commitment to His people. There's a new covenant that Jesus brings. Number two, we know from Psalm 22 that the Messiah, God's chosen King, would be forsaken and pierced and yet vindicated. You can read Psalm 22. David's writing the psalm about his own trials, and yet he describes his trials as if he's literally being crucified. And what's interesting, crucifixion wasn't invented for another 500 years. Speaking of the Messiah's the way the Messiah would be forsaken and he would die and yet he would be vindicated. Number three, he, it's prophesied that the, God's chosen king would be, re, would be called the rejected cornerstone. This is one of Jesus' favorite verses. It was from Psalm 118. He would say this over and over again as would the, uh, as would the writers of the book of Acts. That he's this cornerstone. He's the one that, that is the foundation for all that God wants to build. And yet he was rejected. The Bible predicted that Jesus would be rejected. And lastly, Psalm 16 talks about that the Messiah would be resurrected. That after he was rejected and killed, he would actually be brought back to life. What is all this about? All this is about is God confirming his word so that we could read his word and know that we're not just talking about ideas, but realities. That Jesus is the reality. That we're not just thinking of, wouldn't it be nice if there could be joy or love or hope? But we can know, no, wait a second. God pierced history and confirmed that by fulfilling all these Old Testament prophecies that we see. This is what Paul's trying to say. He wants his readers to be encouraged that God has confirmed his truth. And it's because of Jesus that we trust that truth. Jesus is the reason we believe God has spoken in his word. Now, in verses 9 and 11, what the Apostle Paul does here is he strings together these different verses, okay? Um, uh, we'll, we'll just kind of go through this really, really quick. And notice he says in, um, where is it? Yeah, there it is. He, he, he says in verse, uh, in verse 9, he gives this quote, for, the reason I, for this reason I will confess the Gentiles to you and sing to your name. There he's quoting 2 Samuel 22.50. That's an historical book. And then in verse 10, he quotes Deuteronomy 32.43. That's a quote from the law of the Old Testament. And then in Psalm 117, verse 1, is what he's quoting in verse 11. That's from what they call the Psalms or the Writings. And then, in, and then in verse 12, we see he quotes Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. That's from the prophets. Now, you guys might go, okay, who cares? But this is important because Paul is wanting to make sure that the Jews also know who might be reading this, that God has said in every part of the Old Testament scriptures, every part God confirms his plan was to always, was to always bring the Gentiles, non-Jews, into a covenant with him. 
This is important. Because one of the things that we are struggling with in our day and age is, is a day where we can't decide what we're going to do with cultures. What we're going to do with ethnicities. We don't know what we're going to do. On one end, we want to think, wait a second, I want to be able to, without shame, identify in my nationality. And on another, and another side, we want to say, yeah, but wait a second, we don't want to exalt our nationality over somebody else's nationality. How does that work? How do we bridge that gap? And the only thing I can see in any kind of argument or any kind of philosophy I've seen that bridges that gap is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus, we see God recognizing different cultures, different ethnicities. There's this beautiful picture in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, where every tongue, tribe, and nation is around the throne worshiping Jesus. And yet, listen, we see the Bible is really clear that the Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And we see here in Romans 15 that Paul's wanting to be clear. Listen, God's made it so clear. He's always desired to save anyone from any tongue, tribe, or nation who's willing to put their faith in what he's provided. This is the promise. Now because of this, what's happening is Paul is using these quotations to confirm that this is God's will, but also, listen, to get these Gentiles to know, listen, you need to be willing to worship. You're, the right response to this Jesus who's come is to worship. We're worshiping and celebrating not just the, person, not just the event, but the person. Notice what he says in verse 9. He says, we will sing to your name. The word name, there's this, this idea of name is, is not just like, hey Bob. It's the, it's, it means character or authority. There's something unique about Jesus that we want to celebrate, that we want to worship him. In fact, to the Jews, to worship Jesus would have been blasphemy because they said only God is worthy of worship. And they're right. But because Jesus showed himself to be God, he's worthy of worship. He says a similar thing in verse 11. He says, Loud him, all you peoples. But also, if you notice in verse 10, when he quotes the, he gives a quotation in verse 10, he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, notice, with his people. He doesn't want these Gentiles, these non Jews, to, to hear this or to read this and think, okay, I get it. I'm supposed to go, yeah, the God of the Jews, he's the best. The God of the Jews, he's on top. He's the one, you did a good job for the Jews. Thank you very much. No. Celebrate with them. In other words, God wants us not to just to worship from a distance or worship as a spectator. Yeah, we think this Jesus guy is pretty good. Yeah, we'll give him the, what's the worth due his name. No, he wants us to know him. He wants us, listen, he wants his, his audience to actually experience the salvation that God brought first to the Jews but also to the Gentiles. And this is the thing, this is where the rubber hits the, mo the, the road for us. I, I don't really know of any religion or philosophy that doesn't have some sort of respect for the person of Jesus, with the exception of possibly organized Satanism. Other than that, every religion philosophy has some sort of respect for Jesus. They might say yeah, he was a great prophet. They might say he was a great teacher. He had some good things to say. He tied together East and West ideas and put them together. They might have all these different ideas, but usually, almost always, it's in the positive. And so there's, it's, it's rare that you don't find someone who says, you know, I mean, Jesus is cool. I, I, yeah, I like Jesus. Yeah, I can see why he's a good thing to celebrate. His birth is a good thing to celebrate. But the Bible doesn't let us get away with that. Paul's calling the Gentile readers to more of that. He's saying, listen, you can't just say, he's done some good things. This is about worship. It's about bowing your life before him and saying, no, he's the creator of God who became man and died for us that we might have our sins forgiven. That's what he's calling them to. Now, we get into verse 12 and 13, and when he quotes Isaiah... He brings up this, this person. He, he says, there shall be a root of Jesse. Do you remember who Jesse was in the Old Testament? Jesse was David's father. David, the famous king of Israel. So the phrase root of Jesse, it's, it's pointing to this prophecy that there would always be a king from David's line who would rule on the throne. And the Jews all knew that would be the Messiah, that Christ or that God's chosen king. So the root of Jesse is a, is a reference to that. And notice what it says. And he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. Notice, and in him the Gentiles shall have hope. 
You see, Jesus, listen, is the reason we can experience God hope, God's hope. What is that hope? First and foremost, it's the hope of a just and good ruler. Now, wherever you stand on the current political debate, I think all of us have a bit of pity for Theresa May. What a tough... Who would want that job? Some of you don't. Okay. <laughs> but it's a tough job. Even if she's, she's tanking it big time, it's still a tough job. And anybody who's had to lead any kind of organization will tell you how hard it is to be responsible for other people. And here's the truth. All of us who have been under someone else's authority can tell you how hard it is to be under bad authority, can't we? If there's something that the, the world is longing for, it's someone we can trust. It's a leader we can follow. And there's a, there's a hundred, if not thousands, of those who would put themselves up as to be the leader they can follow. That they're the ones that God's actually chosen. These are what we call antichrists or counterfeit Christ. But Paul here is making it clear. He's saying, listen, we have the, a hope of a just and good ruler because we see that in Jesus. We see that the way Jesus exercised his authority was to do all the things that we would hope God to do and was to do them in a way that showed mercy and grace and acceptance and forgiveness and restoration and justice. All those things he modeled in his life and he brought to, to pass through his death at the cross and through his resurrection from the dead. We know that there's a ruler we can trust because the one who said, you should come follow me. Jesus didn't say, hey, follow these teachings. He said, follow me. Which wouldn't make any sense if he was still dead. But he's not dead. He conquered death. He's alive. And so we can have a hope, an expectation of good, that no matter what happens to us, we follow one who's conquered death. That's why we have hope. See, our hope is not, man, I hope there's enough food for the Christmas bringing share. Or, I hope the kids remember their lines. Never going to happen. <laughs> You know, or I hope I get what I wanted for Christmas, or I hope my marriage lasts another year, or I hope my kids finally get cleaned up off of drugs, or I hope my partner survives cancer. Our hope is something much bigger than that. Our hope is that there's a king who rules. And his name is Jesus, that we can trust. This is what Paul's trying to get these guys to think about. This is what God wants to give us, wants us to think about. He says in verse 13, Now may the God of hope fill you. I love this because Paul's praying here, not to, just that they would experience some sort of emotional experience of, oh, I, I feel hope now, but that God would do something in them. That God would fill them, God would, the word is, satisfy them with an expectation of good. That they would be convinced that the, the, the God who showed himself in the person of Jesus is the God who can be trusted. Is the God who we can expect good from. It's interesting because later on in the verse he talks about that these things could happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's a hint here of what Paul's talked about earlier in the book of Romans about the fact that being a Christian isn't just about understanding ideas and conforming your life to those ideas. Being a Christian is following a person. It's having a relationship with your Creator. And we have that relationship with our Creator because that Creator Himself comes to live in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. That He gives us new life when He forgives our sins. And He comes to dwell in us. And part of Him dwelling in us is He teaches us, He Himself teaches us how to have hope in Him. You, you, many of you guys wouldn't know this, or some of you guys do, some of you don't, but Ryan, who was the innkeeper today, and his son Caleb, yes, that's his son, 15 years old, 6 foot 5 son. <laughs> In their family, their youngest daughter, Liliana, 
uh, had an illness this week, was in the hospital for several days. Very scary time, not knowing what was wrong. And so we just said, you know, Ryan, we're praying for you. Just, you know, I, I said to him, you want to just kind of, let's just skip the sketch. You know, don't, don't worry about doing this. He goes, no, no, no. God's good. We're going to still do it. Do you know why? It wasn't because Ryan wasn't afraid. Uh, he was afraid. He was like, oh, this is my baby. What's going to happen? It wasn't because the Hubbard family doesn't care. <laughs> or they're just really into their acting. It wasn't that. It was that their hope is bigger than just their family. It's bigger than that. They know in whom they've believed. Their hope is in Him. See, God wants to teach us to have hope. Listen, I, I don't want to pretend that I know all the junk that you're going through today, but here's what I do know for sure. That God, who is good and in control, is allowing you to go through that junk so that you would know the hope that only He can bring. A hope that's bigger than just a really good Christmas. A hope that, the, 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 that Christmas happened in the first place. And, and Paul writes here that that hope is something that produces in us joy and peace. Do you know what joy is? Well, let's make sure we know what it's not. Joy is not about everything being okay. Joy is not about your circumstances. That's what happiness is. Happiness is when everything's happening good. You feel like, I'm happy. I'm blessed. Everything's happening well. Nothing wrong with happiness. But we all know happiness is fleeting, isn't it? You know what joy is? Joy is, is us knowing that we can see things. Joy is us seeing things from God's perspective. That the God of joy knows exactly what He's doing. And even if our life is difficult right now, God knows what He's doing and we can still have joy. Listen to how Peter writes this. Peter says, Your faith is being tested like fire that tests and purifies gold. And though your faith is more precious than gold, he says you love Jesus even though you don't see Him. And even though you've never seen Him, he says now, uh, he says, now you trust Him. And trust in Him, you rejoice with a glory of inexpressible joy. You rejoice with a glory of inexpressible joy. Where does that joy come from? Does it come from life going good? No, because Peter's saying, you're going through really horrible times, difficult trials. They are testing your faith. And yet God says, I can still give you joy. If you can see that I'm working something good. Hey, I don't mean that to be trite. I know your situations are difficult. But this is true. This is what happens when we have the hope of a good king. The expectation that he knows what he's doing. He also talks about peace. He talks about peace. Do you know what peace is? Well, let's say what peace isn't. Peace is not about you understanding all that's going to happen. Oh, I get it now. This is the reason this happened. Man, there are so many things that happen to us and we think, God, what are you doing? Why did you let this thing happen to me? I don't understand. Okay, maybe I made a mistake here, made a mistake there, but this seems over the top. Why, God, is this happening? You know what? Oftentimes, God doesn't give us the answer. But here's what He promises us. A peace that's better than understanding. Listen to this. In Philippians, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God about what you've... Uh, I can't read my own... No, sorry. Tell God about what you uh, need. Thank Him for all that He's done for you. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. This is the peace that's produced by hope, when our hope is not an idea, but our hope is in this person of Jesus who died for us and rose from the dead. See, Christmas is about joy and it's about hope, not because of how fun it is to celebrate or just because this idea that somehow that, that He brought to the scene. It's about joy and it's about hope and it's about peace because we believe that Jesus is who He said He is. He's the one that the Old Testament Scriptures talked about. He's the one that came as he said, lived just as we expect God to live if he came as a man. Died in our place 
and rose from the dead so that anyone who's willing to turn from their sin and put their faith in Him can be forgiven. See, what we want to give you for Christmas this year, what we want everyone to have for Christmas this year, is Jesus. It's Jesus. Because without Jesus, there is no hope. There is no joy. There is no peace. But when our faith is in Him, we have all that He's died to give us.